και η πνεύματι και νυν και αίκη τη αιώνα των αιών. Αμήν. Χριστέ το φω των αληθινών των φωτίζων και αγιάζουν πάντα άνθρωπον εχόμενων ει τον κόσμο. Σημειωθεί το εφημά στο φω το πω όπω σου είναι με αυτό ψώμεθα φω τα οπόσιτων και κατεύθυνον τα διαβήματα ημών πω εγκασί των εντολών σου. Πρεσβεί τη Παναχάντου σου μητό και πάντου σου των Αγίων. Αμήν. Ουρανός πολύ φωτός, η Εκκλησία ανεδείχθη απαντάς, φωταγωγούσα τους πιστούς, ενώ εστώτες κραυγάζομαι του θόντων
Christ is risen. Christos Anesti. Your Grace, Bishop Kiriakos of Sozopolis, Reverend Fathers, dear friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for coming this evening to the first talk of a series called The Power of the Word. This series of talks was born out of a very small experiment that I had done with my Year 8 Orthodox Studies class and I had shared with His Grace and upon His request, I am humbled and grateful for the opportunity to share and present this evening. I'm also grateful to my spiritual fathers who have guided me and helped me come to this point tonight. Αγαπητοί αδελφοί, δεν θα μιλήσω όλο στα ελληνικά τώρα, αλλά ίσως στο τέλος θα κάνω μια μικρή συνοπτική από την ομιλία μου στα ελληνικά για να μπορέσω να εξεπερετήσω και εσάς που έχετε έρθει και έχετε κάνει τόσο κόπο να έρθετε εδώ απόψε να ακούσετε την ομιλία για τη δύναμη του λόγου. My talk, brothers and sisters, is slightly different, has a slightly different slant to it from those that will be presented during this series. As I said before, it has come out of an experience in my Year 8 Orthodox Studies class. And for those of you that don't already know me, I probably should have introduced myself to begin with. My name is Dean or Kostandinos Damatopoulos. I am a teacher at our school, Oakley Grammar, um, a chanter at Saint Sanargiri. And I teach Orthodox Studies and Science at the school, so I teach from grade six right through to year nine. And so this has come out of my classroom experience. And because I am a teacher, I like to ask a lot of questions, so be prepared to answer some questions as well. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to start with two colloquialisms. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, they never hurt me. And I'll quickly go back to that. Iglosa Kokala denehi, ala kokala tsakizi. The tongue doesn't have bones, but it, break bo it breaks bones. Have we all heard these sayings? Yes, we've heard them. Do we understand what they mean? I think we do. For me personally, I was taught in the beginning that sticks and stones, they break your bones, but words they never hurt you, and that was my thing at school and getting through diff different challenges in life. But as I got older, iglosa kokala denehi ala kokala tsakizi became something a little bit more meaningful to me. Words, brothers and sisters, are the principal way we all communicate with each other. With our words, we communicate to God. We also speak to ourselves self-talk, and communicate with other people. But it's not only about the words that we speak, but the words that we think and the words that we feel. All these things, they shape our, our paradigm, our mindset, and phronima, our soul. They even impact upon creation itself. What we consume through the media, music, advertising, what we speak becomes who we are. And this is very important to remember. It becomes who we are, especially those unspoken words, those words in our thought processes they become part of our being. They influence us in such a way that then it's very hard to come back out of that thought process. This is rather confronting. It's confronting that we're consumed by so many words in our life and that the information and that we're bombarded by so much information. We disseminate that information so easily. I mean, you just look on social media and we share, 
we click like, we do, do all of these things without even thinking about what we're sharing, what we're posting. And sometimes we do it so quickly, or like I like to think about as Greeks, we are quite hot-headed individuals and passionate. That we say that which comes to our mind and we say it without a thought. We don't think for one minute that what we're going to say is right or wrong. I am entitled to say what I want. I'm entitled, yeah? I have the right to say what I want to say. That's my right. That's my democratic right in this nation that I can speak and say whatever I want whenever I want, however I want but I forget that what I say impacts the other person it impacts me as a person it impacts the other and then it therefore by osmosis impacts the environment we are in and we don't think about it we don't spend one minute to think about it. We just say it. I've said it now. It's off my chest. But that's not the case. Words are the primary way by which we are educated, nourished and mature. In a society that uses words in such a crafty way, I don't have to get into the politics of it all. But the best way to deconstruct a society is to deconstruct its language. And this is what we see around us constantly, a deconstruction of language. Well, this is not politically correct. This is not the right way to say it. And so while we do that, we deconstruct the world around us. We need to become more watchful and aware, not only on how our words impact our choices but on the broader scale the more tangible effect that they have on the created world you can see here three jars of rice and these three jars are also here as well i actually brought them in so you can see them practically and what i can do at some point i will circulate these around so you can actually see these jars and see what's in them and what's happened while I explain the experiment. So I'll leave these jars over here. I'm going to start this one here. Yeah, see? Don't open the jars, they're a biological hazard. <laughs> Please don't open the jars, they are a biological hazard. So what if I told you that water had a memory? Would you believe me? Or that water responded to stimuli of some sort. You'd think I'm a mad person and that I'm off with the fairies and telling you heebie-jeebies. Dr. Masarao Emoto, a Japanese scientist, had discovered that when exposing water to various stimuli, it crystallized. These are the crystals that you can see. So here, he exposed the water to evil thoughts, words, music. I think he actually used heavy metal music as well, I'm not sure. He exposed another vial of water to, to love, to kind thoughts, to beauty, to prayers, to gratitude. And the other one, just to disgusting thoughts. We don't need to go into more detail there. Whilst Dr. Masarau passed away in 2014, other scientists have begun to see that perhaps there is some relevance to his work. Now again, disclaimer here, many people in the science world will say that he's a pseudoscientist. Many people. I'm not here to prove or disprove that, but I'm here to present the idea. So Dr. Jared Polak of the University of Washington and Nobel Prize winner Dr. Dr. Luke Montagna have already taken a keen interest in his work 
and also begun to look at things like how vibrations impact water particles. Okay, so there's a lot of research coming out now about how vibrations impact not just water particles but other things. And so we know vibrations we produce through sound. So when we produce different sounds, there are different vibrations and different frequencies. And these frequencies impact various things. There's a little bit more information later on, but we'll talk about that as we move through. The Rice Experiment. This is the penultimate task. So the Rice Experiment was framed through the lens of Jesus' words from the cross. Their salvific nature. And I can see one of my students here this evening, and I'm very glad that him and his family were able to make it. But we looked at, the, we had to understand the nature of words before we understood the nature of Jesus' words on the cross. So while we didn't have the equipment to look at how water crystallizes when exposed to different stimuli, another colleague of mine had shared an experiment with some detail of rice. Being science trained, I was a skeptic. I, I was quite skeptical. You can ask my students. I thought to myself, I can't do this. This is not going to work. But anyway, because the students had asked for this experiment to take place, I thought might as well. So I did my best to ensure that the test was a fair test and that the scientific method had been applied. The rice was boiled in one bowl, then distributed into three sterilized jars that you can see over there of the same size on the same day, sealed and labeled. That's as scientific as we got. They were labeled good, bad, and ignore. Following prayer, at the beginning of every lesson, we commence our lesson with prayer. In our Orthodox Studies classes, the jars were circulated to each student. Each student spoke to the jars. They said, sir, can we say whatever we want? I said, as long as I don't hear it, Pedia, best to tell it. Whatever you want to say, say. Whether you want to curse the rice or bless the rice, it's up to you. I don't want to hear what you say. Then there was the ignore jar, and that at the commencement of the lesson was thrown or placed somewhere in the classroom where no one else would interact with it. The jars were not, when the jars weren't taken to class, they lived in that plastic bag in my office and didn't, weren't touched. After a period of two weeks, we began to notice a change in jar B. So jar B is this jar here. We began to notice a change in this jar. Okay? We began to see mould forming on the jar. Not only was mould forming, but the rice began to discolour. And upon observation, it began to rot. This was the jar that had been exposed to bad words, thoughts and feelings. The ignored jar, similarly, also began to possess mould. Now, being, having a science background, the mould on these two jars is quite different. This looks more like penicillium, okay, and penicillium also has therapeutic properties. And this is decay, black mould, decay, rot. The eye jar, what was interesting, and if you look underneath, can, you can see that the rice is still relatively whole. The kids were beside themselves, my colleagues were beside themselves, they're like, have you done something to this? 
have you tampered with this? I said, no. What was even more beautiful is that the jar that had been exposed to... But we, the jar that had been exposed to good thoughts, good words, blessings and everything, they can take them and hold them. That dippy does you. As long as they don't open them, that's the main thing. The good jar, and you can see this. This is eight. This is nearly. F- this is n- about two months later. This jar is still white, whole. And what's very interesting, but I haven't done enough research about, the rice has formed a beautiful ball in the center. Okay, so this was, this was the basis of our study of Christ's words on the cross. So the beauty continued. How did these findings therefore relate to, cri- to creation or even Christ's words on the cross? How, how is that possible? What's the, what's the correlation? The penitent thief on the cross cried, Remember me, Lord, in your kingdom. And Christ's response to the penitent thief was, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in my kingdom. That word, that phrase from both the thief and Christ, what did it do? It transformed and transcended the whole being of that man. That sinner, that man, through that word, that salvific word of Christ on the cross, transformed his whole existence and trajectory. He was in the kingdom of heaven. What an amazing thing. And at this point, the students asked, but sir, can't we apply the concept of forgiveness to the jar that we spoke bad to? And I said, Scientifically speaking, the change that has occurred in these jars is irreversible. However, we need to think about this notion of forgiveness in our words as well. And that when we do apply forgiveness, what do we do to somebody? We reinvigorate them. We reinvigorate ourselves when we seek forgiveness. So reflecting on the transcending nature of the words Christ spoke on the cross and bearing in mind what happened in this experiment, what does it have to do with the human person? The human body is composed predominantly of water. Think about it. If we're talking about vibrations and words and feelings and thoughts impacting rice, which has no soul, no feeling, nothing, nothing. In there, it's just rice, humble rice. How much more does do our words, our thoughts, our logismi have an impact on the human person? Think about it. Take it to the next level, the earth. The earth's surface is what? What's the earth's surface? Does anyone know? What percentage? I know, I'm giving away the answer now. It's great because the kids love to wait for the PowerPoint too. What percentage of the earth's surface is water? 70%, give or take. So think again. And Patriarch Bartholomew, the Green Patriarch, who talks to us about creation and environmentalism, think how our words and our actions impact upon the created world. Just ponder that. So with the rice, the rice predominantly absorbed the water that it was boiled in. 
as you saw here, studies have, plant, studies have been also done on plants. Now, plants we know, again, predominantly have water. They've exposed plants to bullying thoughts, negative thoughts, and they've also complemented plants. This has not just been done by me, but other people as well. There's also a lot of research done in neuroscience that talks to us about the impact that words have on the human person, in psychology, in counselling as well. We see all of this. As I said before, I'm not here to prove a point. I don't work in a science lab. I'm not going to go and run a whole heap of tests. But I ran a humble experiment with my year eight students. And I want to present an idea to you. Christ, through his miracles, shows us that he has a mastery over creation. What does that have to do with us? Well, we're created in God's image and likeness. And one of the words I learned recently in my studies of theology was synergitheu. Synergitheu. A beautiful word. To be co creators with God, to be co workers, co synergizers with God. If, therefore, we, brothers and sisters, are co-creators with God, how much do our words impact upon the created world? We just, again, a thought. I'm not here to prove a point. With words we know that we can bless. Oh, before I forget. The less of, if we think of the blessing of water, the prayers that are read upon the blessing of water. Now, I know that there is someone that has looked at how water, holy water crystallizes after it's being blessed. I didn't feel 100% comfortable sharing that information because holy water is holy water. And I don't want to mingle, mess with that. However, we can see that through the prayer of the lesser blessing of holy water, even through the prayer of the great blessing, the prayer of the great blessing is quite long, so I, couldn't, I didn't want to put it on all the slides. However, we're asking for the water to be sanctified and that for those people that are sprinkled with it to be cleansed. Just a thought. With our words, we bless or we curse people, heal or wound. We can reflect the mercy and love of Christ, even in potentially hostile situations, or, or. We can let our nervous system, our passions, get the better of us. So, a question. How do we use the word, the word, or logos, the word of God, how do we use the word to renew creation? What does the Bible teach us? How do we apply that? How do we apply the word in our everyday life? And I love I love this quote by Metropolitan Anthony Bloom. We should try to live in such a way that if the gospel were lost, it could be rewritten by looking at us. So therefore, how do we live the word? Words, we know, have an impact. I hope you've seen that. Words have an impact. The word positively impacts us and all creation. How do we live it? Your grace. Reverend fathers, 
dear friends, Elder Vasilios Gondikakis, the previous El abbot of Iviron, states that the human person is saved through the pursuit of the Archeon Kalos, the ancient beauty. And that holy beauty, Theon Kalos, and the pursuit therein and creation thereof not only saves one's self, but others. Are the words we speak beautiful? Are the words we speak gentle? Are the words we think kind, generous, merciful? Or do we have bad thoughts? bad feelings, kakies, in our hearts and our minds. Because again, it's not just the spoken word, it's what we think. So, in my flyer, I had the quote from Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is our word a lamp to someone else's feet and lights someone else's path? Do we light up creation with our word? Do we apply the word in our life? Let our word be transcended by the word the Word of God, and in so doing, let us as co-creators renew one another and all of creation. I don't have much more to say. I've offered you an idea, a thought, and I want to open this up to questions because I think questions and dialogue and discussion are vitally important here. Α, ναι, πρέπει να το πω και στα ελληνικά. Ευχαριστώ, Πατέρα Σταύρε. Συνοπτικά στα ελληνικά, ο λόγος μας, αυτό που έχουμε και σκεφτόμαστε, όχι απλώς αυτό που λέμε έξω εκεί, αυτό που σκεφτόμαστε, αυτό που είναι μέσα μας, επηρεάζει όχι απλώς εμάς, είτε τον άλλο άνθρωπο, που μιλάμε ή σκέφτομαι κακά λόγια για αυτό τον άνθρωπο, επηρεάζει όλη την φύση. Όλη την φύση επηρεάζει αυτός ο λόγος. Και πρέπει να μεταμορφωθούμε με το Λόγο του Θεού. Και ο Λόγος του Θεού είναι στο Ευαγγέλιο. Και πώς μεταχειρίζουμε αυτό τον Λόγο του Θεού, το ζούμε, πραγματικά, ερωτηματικά. Μια ερώτηση είναι απλώς. Για να, για να κάνουμε εμείς λίγο αυτοέλεγχο στον εαυτό μας. Ερχόμαστε στην Εκκλησία, αλλά προσπαθάμε να τηρήσουμε αυτό το λόγο. Προσπαθάμε να, όταν είμαστε και έρχονται αυτοί οι πειρασμοί που έχουμε όλοι πειρασμοί, το σκεφτόμαστε πώς επηρεάζει τον άλλον. Εγώ ελάχιστος, δυστυχώς, όλοι μας, όπως όλοι μας, δεν είμαι κατάλληλος να έρθω εδώ να μιλήσω για αυτά τα πράγματα, γιατί και εγώ αγωνίζομαι με αυτά τα πράγματα. Συνεχώς. Αλλά πρέπει να είμαστε οφθαλμοί Κυρίου, όλοι μας, και πρέπει να βαστάμε ο ένας τον άλλον τα βάρη και έτσι μπορούμε εμείς όλοι να κληρονομήσουμε κάτι πολύ όμορφο, πολύ καλό και μπορούμε να το αρχίσουμε αυτό το καλό εδώ. Εδώ, τώρα, σήμερα, να συγχωρέσουμε όπως ο Χριστός συγχώρησε τον ληστή στο Σταυρό και τι είπε, σήμερα θα είσαι στην Βασιλεία μου. Αυτό είναι αδελφοί μου. Απλό, συνοπτικό. Ο λόγος μας δεν είναι απλώς αυτό που λέμε και έχουμε το δικαίωμα να το πούμε γιατί είμαστε, ξέρεις. Ο 
ομολόγος μας πρέπει να είναι μετρημένος, πρέπει να είναι αγαπητικός, πρέπει να είναι βασισμένος στο Λόγο του Θεού. Εύχομαι και προσεύχομαι ότι ο Λόγος μας να είναι ένα οφθαλμό για τον γείτονά μας, για τον συνάδελφό μας και να δώσει παρηγοριά, συγχώρεση και αγάπη γιατί αυτή η ομορφιά που λέει και ο γέροντας ο προηγούμενος ο Βασίλειος ο Γοντικάκης αυτή η ομορφιά αυτός ο κάλος σώζει τον άνθρωπο απλά λόγια δεν μπορώ να πω και τίποτα άλλο αλλά θέλω και εσείς να ρωτήσετε ερωτήσεις εάν έχετε ερωτήσεις. Ήθελα απλώς να μοιράσω μερικές σκέψεις μαζί σας, γιατί ξέρω, αυτοί οι άλλοι, οι, οι άλλοι ομιλητές έχουν πιο πολύ γνώση θεολογικά και αυτοί θα μοιράσουν και άλλα για το Λόγο του Θεού και για το Λόγο μας και πώς επηρεάζει τον κόσμο. So, with your blessing, your grace, I'd like to open up to any questions. Please don't be shy to ask questions. Questions are important. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but maybe if I can't answer some of the questions, are there any questions? Υπάρχουν καθόλου ερωτήσεις, και στα ελληνικά ή και στα αγγλικά. Please don't be shy. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's some research being done as well about exposing babies in the womb to various stimuli. So speaking to the babies in the womb and what impact that has on their development. Um, there were some studies unfortunately done, um, I, don't, I believe during communist times in Russia, where sadly, it's a very unethical experiment, but babies were removed from their mother and were ignored and the only thing they were given was food and after three weeks unfortunately these babies died so even what's w with this particular rice experiment even the concept of ignoring somebody of shunning somebody and how that impacts as well on a particular person even though that rice remained whole it still began to mold so yeah our words do impact creation in that way as well. Are there any other? Yes? Hang on a minute, Severia. Wait a minute. It would be interesting to run this experiment again to see whether or not the same sort of mold happens. My instant response to that is the badger was exposed to that much nastiness that it rotted. Whereas the, penis, the jar that was ignored was simply left on its own, just completely left behind. Does that make sense? So it wasn't exposed to nastiness like the bad jar was. Does that make sense? Hope that answers that. But again, that would be something we have to do again, replicate that experiment again, 
to see whether or not we have that response. Up the back, there's a question. I think, yeah, I think that dialogue begins, thank you, Kerry. I think that dialogue begins early on, very early on. And it's exposing our children to the gospel, the word, and having discussions about the word. And it's actually our responsibility as parents to be able to do that. And when we say parents, it's not just we know that to raise a child, it takes a whole community. We all collectively have that responsibility to nourish our children with those words. Because if we set those foundations, then the word becomes part of their being, part of them, and will always guide them. It will be the lamp to their feet, yeah? Which is really, that, and that's where I think it's a really important question. We need to start that as early as possible, that dialogue, those conversations. And it doesn't have to be Bible bashing because I'm conscious that sometimes we can enter down the path of Bible bashing and saying, you must read the Bible otherwise. It has to be something that is authentic. And going back to what Metropolitan Anthony Bloom said, that when we read the word, the word, if the Bible was to be destroyed, and I said this to my students the other day, if the Bible for some reason was to be obliterated, how do we share that message with everybody? We have to be the living example. The word of God has to transcend and transform our being. And that's a daily struggle, a daily practice. So I think whilst exposing them to the word, us living the word is very important. Praxis, action. We need to live in action. Otherwise, it becomes static. It becomes this traditional faith and it means nothing. We have to live it every day. Learn a psalm. Learn the psalms. The psalm should be the balm to our soul. I say to my students, talk, re open up the book of psalms and, talk, and read King David. I said, King David is my very good friend. Why? Because David talks about his pain, his contention with God every single day. And not just his pain and contention with God, but his gratitude for God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. How beautiful. And David writes so eloquently. So the Psalms are that balm. The parables are those stories, again, talking about students in schools. You know, we're lucky we're teaching the parables at the moment. The parables are those stories. The Good Samaritan. Okay, we read the parable of the Good Samaritan. What does that mean? Are you a Good Samaritan? What does that mean to be a Good Samaritan? What does that look like? What does that look like? 
Oh yeah, I know the parable of the Good Samaritan, so I got 10 out of 10 for the test. Bravo, orea. What does that look like, sti praxi? O kalos o samaritis. Borume na xerume ti paraboli. Ala, pos tim pratume, pos imaste emis kali samaritides son gosmo. Afto ene, i praxis, the action. Yes. And I think we'll wrap up in a minute. A couple more questions. Can I answer with one quote? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What did Christ say on the cross? How did that theanthropo Christ, who had human feeling and emotion, what did he do? They spat on him. They condemned him. What, you think the times Christ lived in weren't sinful? Absolutely they were sinful. What did he do? And this is where it comes to, yes, it's a struggle. It's not easy. It's not easy. We all have to work at this chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away, constantly. But that's, that's, the, the ult- that's when we say we need to live the word, that's what we mean. We need to become that. But it doesn't, it's not a magical fix. It not, doesn't happen over, uh, overnight. It takes time. It takes an emptying of ourselves. It takes confession. It takes a good spiritual father. It takes so many things. It takes honesty and transparency with ourselves. This is who I am. This is my pain. This is my hurt. I say it so I can hear things too. That's, that's the only thing I can say. That's the way we should move that. Ne. Ne pate. Thank you, Father. So true. Sorry, I'm just trying to process the question. Nothing comes without struggle. Nothing is easy. Because we're living in the world, but we're called not to be of the world. This is a conundrum. You live in the world, mesa ston cosmo, ala venise tu cosmo, if that makes sense. I'm not sure if my Greek's correct there. And this is a constant struggle. It's going, it's not easy. We constantly have to struggle for this. 
This is why we have to become watchful, conscious of what we see, of what we listen to, whether we engage in gossip, for example. Become aware of that. And I think that only happens when we come closer to Christ. When we come closer to Christ, Christ reveals all of that in us. So it's a constant struggle, but it's, we, we just have to keep going, keep moving forward. My spiritual father keeps telling me, just keep moving forward. Forward, forward, don't look back, forward. We're going to fall. We are going to fall. We will sin. We will be tempted. But how do we, you know what it is? Pick yourself up and try again. Pick yourself up and try again. And if we do that with an, and I, be, and you know, I'm, I'm very blessed throughout my life to be grateful for the guidance of the spiritual fathers I have had and have. Because it's the, the ability to op- be open with your spiritual father and free with your spiritual father that helps you to get through the obstacles. Forget about it. If we think we are the best gnostes, know all the knowledge, forget about it. But if we learn ipakui, to be obedient to and follow the instructions of, then whilst it's going to be hard and whilst it's going to be challenging, we will get through. Correct. When you fall, you rise. That is the, that's what the Word of God teaches us. When you're slandered, when you're persecuted, when you're tormented, you fall, you come up, and you walk again. And then when you walk into somewhere where you know, you're not wanted, it's okay to take the, your shoes off, dust it off, and walk away. But what do you do instead? You pray for those people. Because that's what, as Christians, we're called to do. To pray for those who hurt us. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse. This is significant. It's an agona. Izoine agonas. Stadio. But it's beautiful too. Because if we constantly focus on the beauty, then we're going to get through that. And I'm grateful for those people that have guided me in that way to help me see that. Because the the truth is, we can fall into depression. We can fall into despair. Because we always want to try and do things by ourselves. You know, the I, the me. But again, it's again that submission to Christ, ultimately, and to His Word. So it's a constant struggle. I hope I've answered the question. Costa. And I think we'll have one more question after this. Alithos Anesti. Absolutely, spot on.
thank you, Gustav, for sharing that with us. It's so important. And that's exactly the message I was hoping to transfer it to you all today. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll take these two last two questions and then um, I'll ask His Grace to come forward. That's a really good question. Um, I think that's a whole talk in itself, finding strategies to prepare to, to be able to filter what we say and to pause. But I think practicing a little bit of silence, that little bit of silence before a response, whether that be a counting down five, four, three, two, one, or as we're removing ourselves away from the stimulus, so, for example, if my child is yelling at me about something, if I re retaliate in a way and yell back, then it becomes World War Three. However, I don't agree with the action of that, the child yelling. However, if I remove myself from the situation, whether I walk into the kitchen and do something else or go to my bedroom for a little bit, and then say the Jesus prayer, that calms me down and so I'm able to have a little bit more of a clear outlook when I actually then go back and speak to the child who I, who I will address by saying, are we ready to have a conversation now? Little things like that. That's just a strategy that I have. I have students sometimes who are very upset. But, but, sir, take time take five minutes I want you to sit down for five minutes and I want you to think just calm down just sit down for five minutes sometimes the worst thing you can say to someone that's angry is to calm down but just to sit for five minutes just sit quietly I'll be back in five minutes I'm going to get a drink of water or the other situation could be can you go and get something from your room or whatever it may be so reducing our our, our distance from the stimulus does that make sense trying to find ways to reduce our distance from the stimulus, whether that be walking away, going to our room, saying a kumbuskini of prayer, whether that be standing in front of our icon quietly, whether that be going outside, different things. And in lockdown, I'm sure that was more of a challenge for most of us, but there are those practical strategies. I hope that helps. And there was another one more question. <clears throat> Thank you. I, and on the point of science, I have shared with um, one of my lecturers, Dr. Philip Cariatlis, in a conversation that we were having, that I believe science and faith are a synergy. You know, we have a very fixed mindset, particularly in Western culture, that science is opposed to faith. God endowed man with the nous to d discover the created world. And, you know, I'll leave a question for you. Did Einstein discover the theory of relativity or invent it? It's a theory, but he discovered it. But God gave him the ability to discover that. 
it was already written in creation. Yeah, 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 that's all right. Last. Mm. Mm. That's right. Okay, um, just to give an overview of the series and then His Grace can finish up for us tonight. Um, the series is on Go Youth Melbourne, the Facebook page, um, and will be shared through that. Um, the next talk is by Doc, Dr. Nicholas Manolios, and it is at St. Constantine and Helen's Church. Father Pandeli is the parish priest there, so we will be heading there on the 26th of May for that talk. Following that, there is um, a talk by Father Gerasimos Kuturas from, uh, at St. Haralambos in Templestow on the Sunday, the 5th of June. And wrapping up the series on the power of the word is our very own Father Chris, um, who will be presenting on In the Beginning Was the Word at the parish of Saints Raphael, Nicholas and Irene in Bentley. Again, that is on the 14th of June. So, put this one, if you want to screenshot that, so you have it on your phones, so you remember. Dr. Nicholas Manolios, next week at St. Constantine's and Helen at 7 p.m. I omilia thainist anglica, naxerete? Εγώ απλώς απλώς σας είδα σήμερα και προσπάθησα συνοπτικά να σας πω και κάποια λόγια. Um, Dr. Nicholas Manolios is a professor of rheumatology at the University of Sydney and senior medical staff specialist at Westmead Hospital, Sydney, and his research interests include drug design, drug delivery, and gene therapy. I'd like to thank His Grace yet again. I'm very humbled for this opportunity and all of you for coming this evening. Your Grace. Θεοφιλέστατε, σεβαστοί πατέρες, αγαπητοί εν Χριστώ αδελφοί, να ευχαριστήσουμε τον κύριο Κωνσταντίνο που σε λίγες μέρες μας προσκαλεί όλους για τη γιορτή του. Είναι του Αγίου <laughs> Κωνσταντίνου, <laughs> μόνο που δεν έχουμε τη διεύθυνση ακόμη, <laughs> αλλά θα την πάρουμε σύντομα. Ευχαριστούμε τον Κωνσταντίνο για τον εξή λόγο, διότι είναι ένας νέος από την παροικία μας και το μέλλον του ελληνισμού και της παροικίας είναι αυτοί οι νέοι που στέκονται δίπλα μας και έχουμε κάθε υποχρέωση να τους στηρίξουμε ούτως ώστε να λάμψει η Ορθοδοξία αλλά και ο Ελληνισμός σε αυτή τη μακρινή χώρα που μας έφερε ο Πανάγαθος Θεός. Με τις ευλογίες του Σεβασμιωτάτου και του Θεοφιλεστάτου ευχαριστούμε όλους για την παρουσία σας. Όσοι δεν βιάζεστε μπορείτε να περάσετε πίσω στο χολ όπου θα πιούμε ένα καφεδάκι, δεν λέμε φλιτζάνια, μόνο το καφέ θα πιούμε, το τσάι και θα αποχωρήσουμε με την ευλογία του Θεοφιλεστάτου. Διευκόν του Αγίου Δεσπότου ημών, Κύριε Ιησού Χριστέ, ο Θεός ημών ελέησον και σώσον ημάς. Αμήν. Μόνο να σας πω ένα, ακόμη ένα λόγο, α, που με τις ερωτήσεις που, που είχετε πει, ερωτήσει, ένα μικρό λόγο. Εμείς θα κληθούμε από κάθε λέξη, κάθε λόγο, που θα πούμε στη ζωή μας. Και για να, για να γνωρίζετε πόσο δυνατό είναι ο λόγος και να το βάλουμε υπόψη μας πως κάθε λέξη που θα πούμε στη ζωή μας αυτή η λέξη 
θα είναι μπροστά μα στη Δευτέρα Παρουσία. Κάθε λέξη θα κληθούμε από αυτό που θα πούμε. Έτσι να είμαστε όλοι πολύ προσεκτικά. Το άλλο είναι, είναι κάτι πολύ μικρό που είχε πει ο Κώστας, να είναι καλά, που κάποιος είχε ερωτήσει μία ερωτήση για την κοινωνία. Ε, πώς πρέπει να είμαστε όταν πάμε να έξουμε το λόγο. Η Εκκλησία μας, αυτό το είχε μάθει, ε, κάποιος μου είχε πει όταν ήμουν στο Αγιονόρες και μου είχε πει, η Εκκλησία μας έχει... Ε, Κοιτάξει όλα τα πράγματα και κάτι που αυτές τις ημέρες μερικοί δεν το τηρίζουν είναι το σαρανταήμερο για τα παιδιά. Παγιά στα χωριά και στις πόλεις, κάθε κυρία που ήταν, που ήταν να γεννήσει ένα παιδί κράτε το παιδί της στο σπίτι και δεν έβγαινε έξω. Και τις είχαν πει οι παγιοί δεν μπορείς να πάει έξω ώσπου να το πάρεις το παιδί μετά από 40 μέρες, όπως έγινε στην Παλιά Διαθήκη, επειδή μπορεί να πειραχτεί το παιδί. Γιατί είναι αυτό. Ο λόγος πάλι. Κάπως μπορεί να περάσει από εκεί να δει το παιδί και να πει τι όμορφο παιδί και να του βάλει κάτι άλλο πνεύμα πάνω του. Ή να του βάλει κάτι άλλο με το λόγο πάλι να του πει μία άσχημη λέξη. Όλα αυτά η Εκκλησία τα, τα έχει προς ναι προς έχει διοθετήσει για να προσέξει τον κάθε άνθρωπο που είναι στην στην εκκλησία από λόγο από άλλους ανθρώπους σε η εκκλησία μας τα έχει κοιτάξει τα πάντα και έτσι ήθελα να σας πω αυτά τα δύο παραδείγματα αλλά να ξέρετε κάθε λόγο που θα πούμε θα μας κρίνει ο Θεός και έτσι να, να είμαστε πολύ προσεκτικοί. Βοήθειά μας. Να μην ξεχάσουμε να ευχαριστήσουμε και αυτούς τους τεχνίτες που στέκονται δίπλα μας και οργανώσαν αυτά εδώ όλα τα ηλεκτρονικά, τα οποία εμείς δεν έχουμε γνώση, εμείς οι νεαροί σαν εμένα.